So good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that uh, in the last lecture, at the end of the last lecture, some of you tried to tried to to contact me, but I could not hear anything. Uh, if you have still some doubts, uh, you can. Uh, if it is a um, a short doubt, uh, please let me know it now. If it is a longer question, uh, we can uh, send me an email and we can uh, uh, settle a private session in Skype or Zoom. Does anyone uh, wants to make some question? Okay, so apparently no one, uh, but I hope everybody is able to speak okay so let's let's uh, start with today's subject uh, and the subject the main subject is how to model a sample system so you have a linear time invariant system with a transfer function that i assume that i know g of s and i put a da and an ad and the samples are synchronized by a clock. That is to say, this clock generates a, a square wave and uh, the rising times at the beginning of each period of the square wave uh, start taking uh, DA and AD samples the way that we have uh, explained before. So the computer is connected between this input and this output u of kh and y of kh. So the input is exciting the DA with a sequence of numbers that I represent by this graph. These small bullets are numbers at sampling instance. And uh, reads the output, the samples of the output of the plant, y of kh at the sampling instance. And uh, we want to compute the equivalent uh, discrete time transfer function between u of kh and y of kh. That is to say, I give you g of s and you have to compute the equivalent uh, discrete time trans transfer function when you add this da and the d box. And I, just to, to give you um, a better idea. So I have here a sequence of numbers uh, that come from the computer. And at the output of the DA, I have a continuous signal, which is a staircase signal. Each value of the staircase corresponds to the number at the beginning of the sampling, inst of the sampling interval. And the system uh, reacts to this input according to its dynamic, its poles and zeros. So you, you have some curve, which is y of t, it's a continuous curve. Now you take samples of this continuous curve, okay? And we want to find out what is the equivalent discrete time transfer function between u and y in discrete time. Uh, okay, this is the problem. Before we go on, does anyone can think of a way to attack this problem? I accept suggestions. I can't hear you. I noticed some. I'm not, uh, <clears throat> apparently someone is speaking, but I can't hear you. Let's see if there is a, a way of uh, sending messages. Apparently, Apparently, there is no way for you to send me a message, a written message. 
no one wants to to try again giving an idea on how to tackle this problem okay let's use one method of thinking that uh, i mentioned before in relation to several problems so we want to compute the discrete time transfer function so what would be the first thing that you should know exactly in general terms probably the definition of the transfer function so what is the digital transfer function or the discrete time transfer function does anyone remembers No volunteers to speak? Um, okay, yes, please. I just I just the, heard the Z transform or the Z is related to the Z transform is, is what in relation to the Z transform as well. Uh if we have the difference equation then we can uh make up the overall system equation but here you don't have the difference equation you just have a sequence of numbers at the input and a sequence of numbers at the output so you have both signals but what is the definition of the z transform of a system it does not speak it does not uh, uh, speak about uh, uh, difference equations it's it just speaks about something of the input and something of the output and then you do some computations what is the let's think in in a continuous time what is the transfer function in continuous time you have a linear time invariant system okay so what is the transfer function in continuous time you have an input and you have an output okay is a function that relates the output and the inputs of a system considering a zero initial conditions Ah uh, yes, you have to consider zero initial conditions. But how is this relation made? It's related to the Laplace transform in continuous time. What is the percentage divided by the input? Is the Laplace transform of the output divided by the Laplace transform of the input with zero initial conditions? So, in, in what is the discrete time transfer function? is the quotient of the Z yes. Yeah. yes yes it's the same but using the z transform instead of the laplace okay say the whole the whole sentence so it's the uh, output of the z transform uh, z transform divided by the input in the z transform by so it's the z transform of the output divided by the z transform of the input with zero initial conditions okay so let's apply this definition okay definitions are important because some many in many cases they give you a way of computing things okay so uh we should place here a signal a, a, a specific signal u and then uh you compute u of t you compute y of t and you compute y of kh okay so what signal the 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 z transform must be in, is invariant to the system that you to the signal that you put at the input provided it's not zero okay if it's zero zero is zero and that's it uh, so we can select the input signal in a way that uh, makes the computation easier so what signal should we put here suggestions so a step function or but in this case not a step just uh zeros and then everything in ones okay so if i your suggestion your suggestion is to have a discrete time step so zeros before for k less than zero and ones for k bigger and equal to zero okay so let's see what happens if you do it then you are keeping this value during the sampling interval so 
what you get is something which is quite nice, is uh, unit step, okay? In continuous time that you can see here at, at UT. Uh, you, you might be tempted to say, uh, just put uh, one of these numbers different from zero and all the others zero. But that would give you a squared input and it will, it, it's not easy, it's more difficult to compute the response of G of S to a square than to a unit step. Now, my question is now is, how can I compute Y of T? I know G of S and I know that the input of G of S is a step. So uh, how can I compute Y of T? It's the product of both. Y of T is the product of what? What do you mean by yeah, both? The inputs and the transfer function. Uh, the input in what domain? Time domain. If you multiply U of T by G of S, you get a mess. No? So, let's be more rigorous. We have to use the Laplace transform of the U of T. Then okay, get... so I apply, I apply the Laplace transform to U of T, I get U of S. I multiply it by G of S, and what do I get? Do I get Y of T? Uh, no, the Y of S, or uh, the, the Laplace transform of Y of T. Okay, so I, I have to compute, to, to get Y of T from Y of S, what do I have to make? To compute Y of S from Y of T, what do I, what do, I do? To compute Y of T, I have Y of T, and I want to compute Laplace, Y of S. Before. Laplace, I apply Laplace. And to co now I have Y of S, uh, and I want to compute Y of T, what do I do? Inverse. Inverse Laplace. So, Y of T is the inverse Laplace transform of U of S times G of S. Now, U is not an arbitrary signal, it's a step. So what is the Laplace transform of the step? It's something that you know. One over S. One over S. So Y of T is what? Is the inverse Laplace transform of G of S divided by S. Okay, and now to compute y of kh, you just take t equal to kh. It's very simple. The, the model of the AD is very simple. Okay, so what do we have? What do we have? Uh, I put here a step in discrete time, and I end up in continuous time with a continuous time step. The Laplace transform of the continuous time step is one over S. I multiply by G of S and I get Y of S. To get Y of T, I take the inverse Laplace transform, T, trans, TL inverse, the inverse of the Laplace transform of G of S divided by S. Now I do these computations and I get a time function. And for this time function, I do T equal to KH. Now, my discrete time transfer function is the Z transform of Y of KH divided by the Z transform of U of K, KH. So the Z transform of Y of KH is nothing more than the Z transform of all this stuff here. Okay? And the Z transform of U of KH is the Z transform of the discrete time step. Probably you don't know it by memory but it's one divided by one minus z minus one or z divided by z minus one if you want so if you put this formula here on the on the numerator and this other formula on the denominator okay and if you are divided by one divided by one minus z minus one is the same as multiplying by one minus e minus one. So the discrete time transfer function is this awful formula. Right? Here's the formula of Hegel. It looks tremendous, very complicated, but actually 
if you understand what you are doing and you know the definition of discrete time transfer function and continuous time transfer function, then you can easily do it. Okay, you have to think about the diagram and you get this formula. Okay, any question? Let's proceed to to do uh, one example. So the conclusion that we have is that the discrete time transfer function uh, of a continuous time transfer function sampled by a DDI in the AD that are modeled by a zero order old is given by this expression here. Okay, so let's uh, see an example. Before that, uh, actually, MATLAB has functions to, to do this computation. It's continuous to discrete C2D. And if you do D2C, you get an approximation of the inverse problem. That is to say, uh, you have a discrete time uh, system, uh, transfer function, and you convert it and you obtain a continuous time transfer function. Now, C2D has a unique response. D2C can have several answers, but uh, you are taking the most probable, probably one. So the, the definition can may not be unique because you, in the process of discretizing, you are making some approximation. So you, you are losing information. There are several continuous time functions that uh, have the same discretization. And uh, so the inverse operation uh, involves some approximation. But this C2D is exactly this formula, implements exactly this formula. So one way for you to check uh, the results of some problems is by just using MATLAB with C2D. Okay, let's see the, the, the example. The, exa the example is very simple. The example is very simple. Uh, G of S is A divided by S by plus A. A is a parameter. I assume that I know A. And I ask, what is the discrete equivalent to G of S? So the answer is replace G of S by A divided by S plus A in our horrible formula. And you get, you have to compute this. So you have to compute the inverse Laplace transform of A divided by S times S plus A. Then you have to, uh, this inverse Laplace transform is a time function. You have to replace T by KH. Now you have a discrete time sequence in K. And you have to take the Z transform of this time sequence and multiply by one minus Z minus one. Okay, so let's do this. So the first thing is to compute uh, the inverse Laplace transform of A divided by S, S plus A. Now, you split it in partial fractions. This is a technique that I assume that you know. So basically, uh, I have terms that correspond to uh, isolated poles or powers of the same pole. In this case, we have the power is just one, so this one is very simple. And uh, now you compute the, the inverse Laplace transform of the left is the sum of the inverse, inverse Laplace transforms on the, on the terms of the right. So you have to compute the inverse Laplace transform of one over S, which is always one for T bigger than one, okay? So we know that the Laplace transform of one in time is one over S. It's going from the right to the left. And uh, then the, inver the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by S plus A is, is what? Is the exponential of minus 18, okay? And now you are going to do uh, T equal to KH and take the Z transform. So let's start with the first term. The first term is always one. So if you make uh, T equal to KH, it is always one, okay? So this sequence is always one for all values of K. 
and you apply the, the Z transform, you compute it, and you get this stuff. Probably use a, a table of Z transforms. And uh, for, for this other term, so f of t is exponential of minus a t, for t bigger or equal to zero. You do t equal to kh, so you have a power of k of the number exponential of minus a h. Remember that a and h are precise numbers, okay? And k is a variable. Now, you apply the z-transform, and we did that before uh, when we were studying the z-transform, and you get uh, f of z, okay? So, to get gd, you have to comp compute the product of 1 minus z minus 1 by the sum of these previous Laplace transforms. And then you simplify it, and you get the difference, the dif uh, different, the discrete time transfer function. Okay. Now, uh, there are, there are something, a few things that uh, that are interesting here. Uh, you you had a function which was a divided by s plus i. Where, where, where is the pole of this transfer function? Minus i. Minus i, that's very good. And uh, now you have, uh, you have this transfer function. It's written in z minus one, but if you multiply on the top and at the bottom by z, z you get one minus exponential of minus a h, and this disappears, and here you have z minus, E of uh, minus a h, and this disappears. This z minus one disappears. So, where is the pole? The pole is, is a value of zero that makes the denominator vanish. Makes the denominator zero. z equals to e to the a h minus a h uh, minus a h don't forget the minus okay yeah. so uh, what happens is that a pole at minus a is transformed in a pole at minus a h this is a general property so if you have a continuous time pole at p it will be mapped in a continuous time pole of uh, exponential of p okay and uh, you don't create c you don't create poles so you had one pole in the continuous time and one pole in discrete time and this is a, a general property so if you are doing these computations and you end up with uh, uh, more poles in discrete time than in continuous time the situation is clear. You committed a mistake, so you have to go back and find where the mistake is. The number of poles in continuous time and in discrete time are the same. And the poles are mapped according to a very uh, simple rule, which is the exponential. The other thing is, uh, what is the static gain in continuous time? The static gain, I remember, is one. It's one, yes. How, how, how do you compute one? Uh, S equal to zero. S equal to zero. So that, that becomes A divided by A, and that's one. Now, in discrete time, the, the, you are doing nothing more than sampling. In discrete time, the static gain should be the same. OK? Now, how can we compute, given a a discrete time transfer function. How do we compute the static kind? You remember? You do z equal to what? What you? What are you speaking in English, in Portuguese, or just same? Mm. Someone said. Mm. I was trying to think, professor. <laughs> okay. Uh, in discrete time, 
you have to make z equal to one to compute the static gain. Remember, we had some discussion about it that corresponds to make the terms of the, the difference equation constant. So what is the static gain here? You make z equal to one and what do you get? One. One also, as, you, as it should be. So another way of checking your computations is by computing the static gain. The static gain must be the same, okay? This is quite important. And it's, it's a, a, a check uh, uh, that your computations are correct. Okay, now, uh, just one, one question of one, um, one uh, uh, question of, of nomenclature, of naming, is this method is sometimes called this discretization method. You can approximate uh, continuous time differential equation or dynamic system or transfer function in many ways. Uh, and this is called the step invariant method. Okay? This is called the step invariant method because uh, in continuous time and discrete time, the step, the response to the to the unit step uh, signal is exactly the same. Okay? That's why it is called the step invariant method. This is just a question of naming. It's not much important. Now you can do computations like applying the, that formula in many cases. So you can build a table like this. Okay, where you have uh, different uh, trans continuous time transfer functions and you do all the computations and uh, you end up with the equivalent z transform. This one, the first one is very easy. The second one, it's also easy, but uh, you should be careful with uh, expanding the, uh, the partial fractions. Uh, this one, this one here is the unit uh, delay in continuous time that maps in the continuous the unit delay in discrete time. Okay, it's uh, just a matter of thinking. This one is the one that we have already deduced. Now this one is a little bit more complicated, and so on and so on. Okay, and you can have you can have many examples. Okay, you can check these formulas using MATLAB with the C2D method. Okay, so we have we can have these tables. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing that we can take out of this is uh, remember this stuff. So suppose that you have a pole at position SI in continuous time, then it is mapped in a pole at position zi in discrete time. Now, suppose that I have uh, a syntactically stable system in discrete in continuous time. So, good old continuous time, and uh, the system is uh, asymptotically stable. Now I sample it, okay? And uh, I, can, I can use different sampling intervals. Faster or slower, longer, longer sampling intervals. The value of H can be smaller or bigger. What I know is that in continuous time, the system is asymptotically stable. Now my question is, uh, can by sampling, can I get, uh, discrete time system that is unstable. So I start with a continuous time, a syntactically stable system. Can I select H such that in discrete time, I end up with a discrete time system that is unstable? I would like to hear your, your opinions on this. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? So I start with a continuous time system. With a, 
I give you the transfer function and the, the system is uh, asymptotically stable. Okay, now I sample it. I put a DA and a D, and between the A and D in the DA, it's exactly what, let's see. We have this situation here, okay? So G of S, suppose that G of S is asymptotically stable. And uh, uh, now I select the sampling interval. Is there a value for the sampling in interval such that uh, such that the discrete time system is unstable, becomes unstable. Yeah, I think it's uh, when the the frequency is above half the sampling interval, or, okay. or the, the sampling in, uh, frequency in this case. So Andreas says yes. Maybe I don't know. Yes, but he's not so sure, and he can even compute a value. Related to the critical frequency of the system? Mm, no? Yes, something related to the sampling frequency, yeah. Okay, more opinions. No more opinions? Okay. Um, what is the condition for G of S to be asymptotically stable? You have a system with uh, described by a transfer function, G of S, a numerator and the denominator. Okay. Uh, the, the poles, uh, Look. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something with the poles on the left side of the Okay, the so the, if the poles are on the negative. left side of the, the real part must be negative. Yeah, exactly. But, thank you, Andre. Andre is being brave huh, because he's, he's uh, confronting me. That's a good thing. The other are chicken. They they, they don't speak. Okay. Um, okay. So suppose that you have a pole. You know that the, the pole has a negative real part. That's right, Andre. Andre, you agree with me? Mm -hmm. My assumption. Okay. And uh, where is the pole mapped? So let's. Look again at this formula, okay? Suppose that you have a pole at uh, minus two. In discrete time, where is this pole going to be mapped? It's written here in yellow. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, to e to the s h. And the s i s. Where s is the pole, yeah. Uh, S is um, SI is minus two, so the exponential of minus two H. And H is positive because it's a sampling interval. Okay? Now, uh, let's remember what is the condition of stability for discrete time poles? For a system to be stable the, in discrete time, where do the poles must be? Uh, inside the unit circle region? Inside the unit circle. Okay. Now, if you have a pole in continuous time at minus 2, it's mapped in exponential of minus 2h. Is it inside or outside unit circle? Uh, it's it's right in the, the circle, right? The right modular in the circle? One. Right in the circle? Isn't the modular one? No. An exponential, where, where does a, what happens, suppose that you have the function e up to x, okay? L vantada x. And what is the value of uh, the exponential for x equal to zero? e up to zero is what? One. One. And uh, suppose that x is negative. Is the value bigger than one or smaller than one? Smaller than one. Smaller than one. So I, I guess that everybody agrees 
that uh, if we have an exponential with with a, a negative real part of a neg negative uh, with a, the exponential of a number with a negative real part then this exponential is inside unit circle if it is real it's a number smaller than one if it's not real you can split it between a sine a cosine multiplied by the exponential of a negative number so it's smaller its modulus is smaller than one okay everybody agrees with me so yep. if if we have an the exponential of a number which is which has a negative real part uh, its modulus will be smaller than one so suppose that i s i is negative if s i is negative we have the ex or has or has a suppose that it's real for, to start then the exponential of a negative number is smaller than one and you are inside unit circle so you are asymptotically stable in continuous time in no matter how you choose h provided it's positive but i can't think of what is a a negative sampling interval it does not, not make sense for all positive sampling intervals the exponential it becomes the exponential of a negative uh, number so it's in it's smaller than one it's it's inside the unit circle it's all uh, also asymptotically stable okay and this is also valid for the situation in which si is a complex conjugate pair of numbers provided that the real part is negative you always get numbers inside unit circle okay so if you have uh, the the numbers in the left poles in the left part then you will you will have poles in this free time in inside unit circle so you cannot destroy stability by changing the sampling interval Okay. Although the, the idea of Andrea was ingenious, okay, he was trying to, okay, let's see if there is something that. Uh, yeah, I, was, I was trying to decorrect, so yeah. Tell me, Andrea. <laughs> I got it now. I got it. I got it. Okay, but uh, you, you, you were, you were saying the important thing is to think about problems, okay? Usually, the first time we think about a problem, we don't think correctly, but then we think more and we end up with a solution, okay? You, congratulations, Andrea, because you did an effort. I confronted so, the professor. Yeah. <laughs> so the 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 conclusion is this: if we have an asymptotically stable in continuous time by sam sampling, we always end up with an asymptotically stable system in discrete time. Now, let's say a little bit more about mappings of of poles. Suppose that you have poles along these two lines. You see here in this uh, second plot, uh, we can have poles that uh, we have these straight lines, and poles along these straight lines in continuous time uh, they have a, a property. I mean, if if you have a pair of complex conjugate poles that are along these lines, two different pairs, they share what? they share the same natural frequency so the overshoot is the same and the damping ratio is the same now these straight lines poles in these straight lines are mapped in this you see this funny curve so it's the situation is not simple and uh, if you if you say well uh, the maps in this triangle they are mapped in this region that looks like a, a heart okay this shaded region now in this situation we have poles along a circle okay and these poles poles along the same circle what is what property do they share the same modulum uh, the same module so the time scale will be the same okay the time scale will be the same so you you are changing 
the damping uh, frequency, but uh, the, the scale of the system, the scale of the response is the same. And this is mapped into these curves here. It's not, it's not obvious and you don't have it, you know it by memory. Now, let's look at the first diagram. Suppose that you have poles over, over the imaginary axis that correspond to oscillators. So we have a pair of poles, a pair of poles over the uh, imaginary axis. Now, what happens is that for S equal to zero, where do you map, map a pole at S equal to zero in discrete time? Look at the formula. The unit circle. And more exactly, where in the unit circle? For S equal to zero. The intersection with the real axis? The, the, the origin, no? For S, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's correct what you're saying, but it's the origin, no? So for um, in discrete time, in discrete time, where do you get it? Sorry? It must be a, in the real uh, axis on one. What is the exponential of zero? If you make SI equal to zero, what is the exponential of zero? It's one. one. So you are just mapping the, the a pole at zero in a pole in discrete time at one. Okay. Now a pole of zero corresponds to what a system with a pole of zero corresponds to which mathematical operation in uh, in uh, uh, time. If you have a transfer function which is, for instance, one divided by s, which is a pole of zero at zero in continuous time, what is the mathematical operation that you are doing with respect to the input? Integrating. You are integrating. So, uh, what does correspond to to a, an integrator? The pole of an integrator in continuous time is s equal to zero. In discrete time, it corresponds to z equal to one. So the integrator corresponds to a pole at one. Okay. In uh, in the lab, uh, you are controlling. Uh, something that has a motor and uh, the the output has to do with uh, a bar connected to the shaft of a motor and uh, a saída do sistema no laboratório tem a ver com um, a ponta de uma barra que está ligada um, ao veio do motor que roda okay the shaft of the motor is turning so when you apply a constant uh, a constant tension to the motor, the, the motor starts turning around, rotating, okay? So the angle starts growing, and the, this is an integral action. The relation between the velocity of the motor and the position, the angular position of the shaft, the, of the motor shaft. Né? A relação entre o, a velocidade do veio do motor e a posição angular do veio do motor é um integrador, okay? So, when you when you start um, building a model for the when you start building a, mod, a model for the motor or for the system, uh, there is one pole in discrete time that will appear at one. Okay, this is the integral. Okay, so uh, let's look at this system. So you, if you have a pole at here at the origin in continuous time that's an integrator, you get a pole at one in discrete time for z equal to one. Now, when you start having poles within just an imaginary position, say plus, uh, plus ja and minus ja, then you get something that you are traveling, as you were saying, someone said, maybe Andre or someone else, was saying you move on the imaginary axis. If you look at the formula, it's very simple because if you replace SI by JA, you get the exponential of a pure imaginary number, which is a cosine and a sine. A cosine plus J sine, and that corresponds to moving in a circle. Okay? Now, you start increasing the imaginary value of the axis, okay? Going upwards, and for the other one, for the conjugate, you go downwards. 
and you, you are going to move, 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 move. There is a frequency, which is the so-called Nyquist frequency, in which you have reached this point. And then you repeat things. So you can understand that there are several systems with the same poles that correspond to different discrete time systems depending on the frequency of sampling. Okay? Clearly, you want to use a sampling interval such that you avoid this ambiguity. Okay, at this moment, you are completely uh, upset. Neste momento, estão todos completamente baralhados. So, to save the day, to save the day, uh, what is what what is what we have learned? We have learned this important fact: is that a pole in continuous time is mapped when you apply uh, AD and DA converter is a, is applied to or corresponds to a pole in discrete time, which is the exponential of the original pole in continuous time multiplied by the sampling interval. This means an asymptotically stable system is always mapped into an asymptotically stable system in discrete time. Okay. This is uh, what I, uh, I was mentioning before with more detail. Suppose that, and the, it's a special case, suppose that we have this uh, second order continuous transfer function where omega zero and psi this is the Greek letter psi, and this is the Greek letter, letter omega, uh, are parameters, okay? So you know that omega zero is related to the scale, to the time scale of the response. So if you want to have faster responses, you increase omega zero, and the shape of the response is the same, but it's like you are stretching the, the time, uh, the time, uh, uh, scale and psi has to do with the degree of oscillation that you have. So small values of psi means that you have a very much oscillatory system. And uh, when you decrease, when you increase psi, you have more damping. You have more damping, and uh, the oscillation. Uh, dies faster and you have smaller overshoot. Now, I'm assuming that psi and omega zero are positive. If, uh, and for all values of psi and omega zero that are positive, this is a, the poles have negative real parts. So uh, this is an asymptotically stable system. If one of these parameters is negative, then you end up with uh, a syntactically unstable system. But let's let's look at a situation in which psi and omega zero are positive, and uh, so we have an asymptotically stable system. If you do a lot, if you do a lot of computations, do a lot of computations, then you can compute the equivalent. Uh, characteristic polynomial of the discrete times transfer function using these formulas. Okay, so a one and a two are parameters that depend on psi, omega zero, and h. And actually, it's about two pages. It's not. It's not much complicated, but uh, and it's useful to do it once in your life. Now, what happens? Uh, as you see, for psi equal to zero, you are over the unit circle. That's a situation. For psi equal to zero, that's a situation in which you have poles at plus or minus j omega zero. So you are traveling over at the boundary of stability. Okay. And when you change omega zero, of course, this is scaled by h, you are moving in this direction. Okay, you are making the system far faster by increasing omega zero. When you start increasing psi, you see psi equal to zero, psi equal to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and so on, you are moving into the inside of, of the unit circle. Okay, that's increasing the stability degree of, of the planet.
okay? And the fastest system that we can have is a system with poles at zero, zero in discrete time. Where should the poles be in, uh, let's look again at the formula, for the, for the poles in discrete time to be at the origin, where should the poles in continuous time be? Minus infinity. infinity. Minus infinity, that's right. that's right. So one funny thing is that in continuous time, to have uh, an infinitely fast system, a system that responds instantaneously, Okay, you you have to you need to have a pole at minus infinity, but in discrete time this corresponds to a pole at zero. And the pole at zero is something that you can you can it's just one unit delay. Okay, if you have a transfer function which is just one divided by zero by sorry one divided by z one divided by z this is just a unit delay. Okay, it's a system for which you input a signal and the output is the same signal delayed by one sample unit. Okay? So it's, quite, it's a quite funny property of discrete time systems. Uh, it's, uh, well, using an image, the infinity, the minus infinity in this case, it's uh, right next door. Okay, so we have this intuition in continuous time and we have this mapping. Sometimes this formula is useful because you can specify poles, you can specify poles uh, in continuous time and then map the desired characteristic polynomial to discrete time using these formulas because we have a good intuition in continuous time but not in discrete time. Any question? Okay, now what about zeros? What about zeros? There are no formulas for zeros. Or, or there are formulas, but they are very, very complicated. And the situation is not, uh, uh, by no means, does not have the simplicity as you can find in, uh, with the poles. Uh, but we can say something. Now, uh, you can make the zeros to migrate outside unit circle uh, by changing h, by changing the sampling interval. Okay? In many systems, you can, uh, and this depends characteristically on the system, but in many systems, what happens? When you reduce the sampling interval, when you reduce h, uh, then the system, then the zeros tend to migrate to outside unit circle. Now, a zero outside unit circle is something which is not desirable. Remember, uh, in continuous time, uh, you would have poles on the left, on the right, so with positive real part. You remember what were, uh, there was a property of poles, of systems with poles with a positive real uh, part the so-called non-minimum phase uh, zeros, sorry, zeros with a positive ne positive real part, the so-called non-minimum phase zeros. You remember what was the property in some cases that you could observe? You apply a step and what, what could happen? If you apply a step at the system, you are expecting the Output to go raising and raising, but with a zero on the on the with a positive real part, what could happen? The, the system could go to infinity. Uh, the, the system the output could, signal. The output system could decrease and then increase again. Okay, before starting increasing, the system could decrease and then increase again. Okay, that's a in the so-called inverse response. Be careful because the, the expression inverse response has two different uh, meanings. One is related to a negative static gain. 
but uh, it can also mean this uh, this uh, situation in which you uh, want the system to increase the output so you increase the input okay and before increasing the output it decreases the the, the output and then it increases again one classical example is uh, from aircrafts uh, with not much uh, power uh, and when you want to uh, change the you want to force the 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 eight of the of the aircraft uh, you start you you lose a lot of uh, you lose um, some um, uh, I, I'm not sure whether I know I know the correct word in English in Portuguese is sustentação okay so uh, lift. lift 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 that's right lift you you lose some lift and uh, thank you and uh, so your X goes down and then it goes up again okay uh, so also in uh, in boilers when you have a boiler and uh, you think about the level of water inside the boiler and you inject water now uh, you think of water as something which is uh, not elastic okay the the volume of the water is usually uh, constant water is an incompressible fluid but uh, uh, water in boilers they have a lot of uh, steam inside so it's they are quite elastic okay and what happens when you inject water you are expecting the level of water to go up but instead you are injecting water at a temperature which is lower than the one inside the boiler and this causes a condensation of steam which is uh, mixed with the water so the initially the level of the water is decreasing although you are adding more mass of water so initially the level decreases and then increases again okay so you have this inverse response uh, that is very well known to engineers that work uh, with uh, boiler systems uh, so zeros these zeros uh, they cause difficulties to control design remember you remember the story of the root locus the poles of the control system and the poles of the control system they are attracted by the zeros of the system when you increase the gain when you increase the controller gain you approach the zeros of the system now if you have a zero which is outside the stability region in continuous time on the right in discrete time outside the unit circle then when you increase the gain you are approximating a zero which is unstable so um, uh, so you are by increasing the gain you are in entering a stability uh, instability uh, regime okay so zeros that are outside unit circle sometimes you have to live with them because they have to do with the physics of the system but uh, they are something that creates difficulties to control design and uh, in this case what happens is that these zeros outside unit circle they are created because you are uh, reducing the sampling interval you are making sampling faster you see okay this is a little bit counterintuitive because you would expect the more uh, samples of the output i have the better is the control okay in in uh, signal processing uh, the more samples the faster the sampling the better now in control this is not so you see because if you increase the sampling rate that is to say if you are decreasing the sampling interval uh, you can have this effect now uh, this is a mathematical effect where does it come from 
it comes, it's, it's very, it's easy to understand. Uh, you apply an order to the system at the beginning of your inter, your um, sampling interval. You, you apply an order which is, which is to say, you, that is to say, you select the, you select the value of the control variable during that sample period. Okay. Now, the system needs some time to respond to that. And the energy, the energy uh, that excites the system for the same energy, you need, if your sampling interval is smaller, you need more energy. So if you have a controller that works with a smaller time inter interval, then to apply the same energy, the control inputs must be higher. Okay? Uh, this is mathematically, this is something which is not new because if you tend the sampling interval to zero, then the inputs would tend to uh, impulse, the direct impulses, okay? Which have, have an infinite magnitude. So it's natural that you have, when you reduce our sampling interval, you are making your controller much more energetic. Okay, and by doing so, you can cause uh, instability effects. Okay, this is this is something. It's just a uh, heuristics. The the mathematical fact is that in many cases, the zeros opposite to uh, poles, uh, you can have a system with zeros inside the unit circle, and you sample fast enough, and you get a discrete time system with zeros outside the unit circle. Okay. Now this means that the sampling interval is uh, an important tool for your design. Okay, it's a, a tuning knob. É um botão de ajuste importante. It's an important se select uh, value to be selected by the engineer, the designer. And uh, uh, the best solution is not always to to increase but sometimes you have to decrease so there is a compromise okay not not too fast to avoid these effects not too slow because you have to capture the dynamics so there is a compromise that depends from system to system and then you have to do uh, simulations to uh, to obtain uh, the best value okay so uh, You can also uh, apply the same ideas to sampling the state model, but this is not part of the program. So these slides between 129, 130, up to 137, they are not part. They are not part of the course. Okay, they are there if you want to read them. Uh, it's okay if you want to make me some question. It's also okay. But I won't uh, do any question about them uh, for the exam because this involves one formula that allows you see uh, to relate the sample between two different instances. It uses this formula, which is the formula of variation of constants. And uh, some of you have not studied that, so uh, this is not part of the program. Okay, so. Uh, Let's sum up what, what we have learned today. And uh, we have learned uh, three things. It's about one hour and 35 minutes, and we have learned three things. It's a lot of things. The first thing is, uh, suppose that I have the, situ the situation, this situation that we considered at the beginning, okay? We have this situation. We have a continuous time system. I give you a G of S, and I want to compute the equivalent G of Z. Okay? And we have learned how to do that. It's this one. Now, the second thing is, as a consequence of this formula, 
it is possible to prove someone has to turn the microphone thank you uh, as a consequence of this, of this the formula the second the second thing that we have learned is poles poles in continuous time are transformed according to an exponential relationship in discrete time. So, uh, an asymptotically stable, in stable system in continuous time is always mapped into uh, an asymptotically stable system in discrete time. You cannot destroy stability by changing the sampling interval. And the third thing, the third thing is that for zeros, we don't have such a relationship and you can have systems with uh, zeros inside unit circle in continuous time, uh, sorry, so with zeros all on the left plane in continuous time, but when you look at the sampled systems in discrete time, then they can have uh, zeros outside unit circle, provided that the sampling interval H is small enough. Okay, so these were the um, three things that we have learned today. Before uh, saying goodbye, I just want to, to say one thing. In this situation, I assume that we have the continuous time model and we sample it. Uh, this was important because of these properties of zeros and poles. Okay, it's important that we have a uh, structural idea of the design. But in practice, what you see are numbers that correspond to the input signal and numbers that correspond to the time series of the output signal. And you want to build the discrete time uh, model directly from them. This is perhaps the most important part of the course, and we are going to start speaking about that tomorrow. Okay, so this is all for today. Questions? You want to say something, make some comments, ask something, please? This is the moment. Okay, so if no one wants to make any questions, so uh, I say goodbye to you and we'll meet again tomorrow morning. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, Professor. Bye. Bye.